Hi everyone, welcome to episode 42 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Parkava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. Just some quick notices from me before we get into this episode. So first of all, the feed for the podcast has been fixed and all 42 published episodes for the podcast are now on iTunes. So if you're a recent listener and want to go back in time to check out some of the early interviews from guests such as Paul Bassett, the founder of Seek and SquarePay Capital, Justin Dry, the co-founder and co-CEO of Vinamofo, Ash Maria, creator of The Lean Canvas and author of Running Lean and Scaling Lean, among many others, you can now do that directly through iTunes. Also, if you missed episode six of Startup Playbook TV, I sat down with Liam Hannell, the co-founder of Lyra, an AI personal assistant to help you track your carbon impact. In the episode, we spoke about some potential traction channels for the app, retention tactics to keep users engaged, and discussing the B2B versus B2C product strategy. You can find all episodes by searching for Startup Playbook TV in YouTube or following the link in the show notes for this episode at startupplaybook.co. So for this podcast interview, my guests are Al and Lucas Ramadan. Al was one of the pioneers in the global movement of bringing analytics to sport. In the early 90s, he applied data science to the America's Cup, creating a new category of sports performance analytics. In the late 90s, he applied this vision to the internet, creating a new category of digital sports media. His company, Quokka Sports, revolutionized the way people experience sports, and that legacy runs deep in most sports coverages we experience today. He now runs Play Bigger, a category design advisory firm that works with the companies in the portfolios of leading VC firms such as Sequoia and Excel to help them define, develop, and dominate markets. And Lucas is a data analyst at San Francisco-based startup Enjoy Technologies and led a lot of the research and analysis for Al's new book, Play Bigger. In the interview, we talk about assessing market potential, why the best founders have a unique market insight, the importance of defining your problem, and the need to have courage of conviction. Without further ado, here is my interview with Al and Lucas Ramadan. Hi, Al and Lucas. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Real pleasure, Roy. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Um, So for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, um, can you share a little bit about what um, your background story and, and what sort of got you here today? Sure. Uh, Well, I was a young entrepreneur, you know, born in Melbourne. Um, I worked for BHP for many years as a software engineer and and a mathematical programmer is what we used to call them back in then. I guess they're data scientists now. Um, Moved on to work on the America's Cup for a few years in the early 90s as the CTO for one of the America's Cup campaigns. And then at the end of that, sort of had an insight that with this new digital medium, that sport was going to be different. And we created a company called Quokka Sports. It got funded by American VCs, went public, went through the whole sort of dot-com thing. We can talk about that. And then after that, I joined a company called Macromedia, um, quite a famous software development company in San Francisco, and was one of the exec team running that company. We sold it to Adobe, and they become one of my favorite companies because all my stock turned into real stock after that. Um, I retired when I was 50, got bored at 52, felt like I really wanted to work with entrepreneurs, and then about seven years ago, we started a company called Play Bigger. Uh, it's an advisory company. We just finished writing a book, and uh, we're working with early stage and mid-stage startups in San Francisco for the most part uh, around a new discipline we call category design. Fantastic. And Lucas? Yeah, um, I just finished a master's degree in data science in San Francisco. Now I'm working at a small startup called Enjoy Technologies, uh, which is uh, located in Menlo Park. Fantastic. Um, so Al, obviously, you know, we're going to touch on your book and, and some of your more recent work, but just going back to this kind of the start of it all and, and Quokka Sports, um, obviously data plays a really big part of analysis at the moment. I'm a huge Liverpool fan, um, <laughs> follow the EPL religiously every week. Um, and, you know, every, all of the sort of halftime analysis are, is around analytics and, and the data that people are collecting around sport. Um, and that, to my understanding, was what Quokka Sports was sort of based around. Um, which was very new at that time. Can you sh- share a little bit of that story and, and kind of elaborate on, on what it was like sort of bringing that different perspective into, into sport at that time? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the, the thing was, uh, when I said I was working for BHP, what we were doing was doing data collection from the steel mills. So um, it, that was also very new. 
um, that it was only programmable PLC or pro pro programmable logic controllers at the time, which were essentially running the steel mill process. So think of computers driving the machinery to make steel, right? That was new, but it was big difference from humans pulling levers, right? Um, and the guy I worked for, a guy called John Gray, one of the legends from BHP, he believed that data could tell us the answer more than humans or anything else. And so he, he came with this project where we had to collect all this data from the mills. And so we essentially wired all these PLCs, brought them back into a central database. This all sounds so obvious today, but this is back in the late 70s, early 80s, right? So this was when computers were bigger than this room as opposed to in your pocket kind of thing. And, uh, and then John Bertrand hired me for the America's Cup um, early 90s for that reason, because he felt that, you know, data and numerical analysis was going to be a big part of sport. And we pushed the boundaries on the America's Cup, you know, high, highly at that time. Uh, we were collecting probably 40 or 50 variables per second, excuse me, 40, 50 variables four to five times a second again, which is really low frequency nowadays, but at that time was pretty high. Everything from how fast the boat was going, the direction of the boat, uh, wind speed, you know, your angle, all that stuff. And if you watch a yacht race, and this was sort of the insight for what became Quokka Sports, if you watch a yacht race from the sort of the boat behind the boats, it's freaking boring because, you know, you've got two boats basically lined up, kind of cranking through for six or seven miles, just trying to get a boat length or two ahead, right? Uh, it, so if you look at that through your naked eye, for the most part, you can't see it. But the data, holy smokes, you know, five feet, you know, sort of change in range or bearing is a giant thing for those sailors on board and so data gave you that unique insight into sport and so the insight for us was that data was going to become as valuable as video and that you know video changed sport fundamentally I mean that's how uh, wide world of sports and all of the broadcasting that we see today became big was because video was that thing and we felt like with this new digital medium the internet uh, that data was going to become as powerful as video, and it turned out to be true. <laughs> um, and in the process, so as part of that, we believed that there was going to be a new generation of digital sports company, a company that was able to capture all of that data, whether it's scoring data, timing data, biometric data from the athletes, any other sort of data, and combine it into a compelling uh, presentation or experience and we called it the total sports immersion. That was the thing we did, you know, and we did it for, and our, essentially our first event was this thing called the Whitbread Round the World Race. It was in 1997, and we said to, and there was 12 boats rallying, racing around the world. There were a whole way around the globe. It was going to take nine months. And so we made a deal with all of the athletes that if they would take a camera and wire all of their um, navigational systems into our system and transmit that off via satellite that we would essentially publish this thing called Total Sports Immersion and allow people to follow that race. And they did. And uh, it fundamentally changed the way sailing is viewed today. And uh, uh, there's a funny story, the day that the Whitbread went live we basically browned out the internet in South San Francisco with the number of people who wanted to sort of watch this thing. This was an event you couldn't even sell the rights to on television. No one gave a hoot about that but the internet it was so powerful and um, there were stories told during that event uh, one in particular when uh, a boat went over in the southern ocean of, it was actually Paul Kayard told this story of his friend who was at the top of the mast trying to cut the spinnaker down and there was nothing between you and Paul you got it straight and if there was in a normal situation you know time would have you know, sort of taken out some of the emotion and the PR people would have stepped in and said, you can't say this, 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 and this. But he just told it as it was. And I remember there was a bunch of people read this thing one time and it was like, holy crap, this is like the athlete's view. This is, it's, and it's like watching, reading tweets today about from the athletes in the Olympics or whatever it might be, right? So that was what the whole Quokka thing was. And it was so successful that uh, we raised about $200 million and went public. And we won the rights to the, Olympic Games in Nagano, Sydney, and beyond. And um, then we expanded into from just sailing into action sports and the Olympics and a number of other different sports in the United States, college, golf, and all that sort of stuff. So it was, it was a fascinating journey. And um, we created a new ca category called you know, digital sports media. 
and uh, it was different from Yahoo and it was different from if you like the news tabloids where there was someone else telling the story it was straight out that came out of the the, uh, the instruments or the people who were actually in the event um, so so that kind of leads on into what you're sort of doing now with uh, with your new book which is play bigger yeah it's called play bigger uh, how rebels and innovators create new categories and dominate markets is the is the title of the book here uh, in Australia and um, there was a bridge between Quaker sports uh, and the book um, which was a time I spent with Macromedia and then Adobe. Um, fabulous time in, in my professional career, almost 10 years. And um, I really got to learn how big software companies run. Uh, I was one of the senior execs at Macromedia and then running a whole business unit for, uh, for Bruce Chisholm and Sean New at, 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 at Adobe. And, and so really came to appreciate sort of what you needed to do to make all that happen on the company and the product side. But I always felt like there was this third piece called the category that had to be done well as well and uh, like I said when I retired I, I, I felt like this was something that we should really work on and so my, my two partners um, Dave Peterson and Christopher Lockhead and I created a company called Play Bigger, uh, playbigger.com and you can read all about it there but it's a, essentially a consulting company. Uh, we didn't know what we called ourselves back then, we didn't have a category for ourselves. Uh, we're either management consulting or marketing consulting. Um, ultimately, it's actually now called category design. It is a whole new discipline of its own, just like agile development, just like experience design, industrial design, any of these other sort of methodologies or design sort of theories. And um, we worked with probably plus or minus 25 companies, uh, all fairly high profile, all VC backed uh, from some of the great VCs in, in the United States. and. Um, a pattern started to emerge about what great CEOs should do. And we looked at probably each year we got approached by about 100 companies, could only ever do three or four of them just because there was so much heavy lifting and so much work. And so we just sat around the table one time and said, this is crazy, we need to sort of get this discipline documented and out there and that's the reason for the book is now for 15 bucks or 25 bucks you can get essentially a playbook for how you go do this and now we have hundreds potentially thousands of people actually pursuing category design it was taught with uh, in the masters of science and engineering at stanford um in the in, the, in, in last year which was a real honor and really fun to see 50 of the brightest kind of engineers in the world sort of tackling this so that's what it is. It's called Play Bigger. It's a story. It's a s series of uh, examples, as well as the sort of the science of categories. There's a whole playbook on how you go about doing it. And it's all told through the lens of the great entrepreneurs of our time. Um, everyone from you know, Mark Benioff to Steve Jobs to, um, to young people that you might not have heard of. And their journey to define and develop and ultimately go on and dominate their categories. Absolutely. Um, just, just wanted to pick on one of the things that you just touched on, which was, you know, you see a hundred plus companies from, you know, you work with venture funds such as Sequoia and Excel, um, who are investing in some of the best sort of startups of our time. What, what is it that you look for in the four to five companies that you work with each year that makes you go, you know, out of the hundred that we see, these are the ones that we, that we want to really work that, with? That is a great question. Um, and we get asked that a little bit from the entrepreneurs themselves. Because they're trying to figure out how do we, you know, how do we uh, explain what it is that we do. Um, the first thing we look for is a thing called we we call category potential. Um, and there's a great VC in America called Steve Vasulo, um, and Steve sort of says, "Hey, I look for zero billion dollar markets. That's his thing." And it, which makes no sense when you sort of say it, but then it's like, wait a sec. And it's actually true. We look for a thing called category potential, which is how big. If, if, if this problem, how many people does it impact and what is the value it could create if you solve the problem? Uh, what does that look like? You know, and something like social media when it first came out, it's like, how big could that be? Well, you know, how about four or five billion people using this thing? And ultimately, that's a giant category potential. And Facebook's at like $450 billion today just themselves, and they own probably 85% of that market. So that's one of the things we look for. Um, and the second thing we look for is... Most companies go through a journey of sort of startup phase, then there's the product design phase of that. Some people call it product market fit. There's all kinds of pieces to that, but it's essentially do we have a product that works and does it solve that problem? And then there's the third piece, which is the, cat, the company design piece of this, which is 
how do you bring this to market? Whether it's if it's an on the enterprise side, do you have a sales team or a go to market sort of strategy that gets to those enterprises? Or if it's on the consumer side, how do you get to the individual? So if, if you've got category potential and a good two legs of the triangle, the product leg and the company leg, and then the third piece is, is if you as an entrepreneur or a CEO really believe that you can and want to be out front and define the category that fits with the product and the company, then we're probably interested in working with you. That's what we're looking for. Sure. So, I mean, obviously on the company and the product side, that would be more things that people are most sort of familiar with. But when it comes to, um, I guess, quantifying the, the category potential, what's... Um, I guess I you know, don't have to go into too much detail with that, but what's what's the general process that you sort of go by where you we kind of quantify that and, and sort of you know assess that between the hundred different opportunities that you see? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question too. Uh, it is it's centered on the problem. So, uh, and this is almost the most difficult thing for an entrepreneur to answer. If I said to you, "Hey, Roy, um, what's the problem you solve with your podcast?" What would your answer be? What would my answer be? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, so <laughs> we are talking about this just before we turned on the podcast. But um, so for me, it was it's all about educating a lot of startup founders. Um, I see that uh, there's A, a lot of information that's out there. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons that are learned from people that have been there and done that before. And what I wanted to, to do through that podcast was um, allow for people who are at the start of their journey or who are currently running, run, you know, running their own business to have access to that information, be that from an investor point of view, from a successful startup founder point of view, from an industry expert kind of point of view as well. Um, so yeah, just make that resource available to give them a chance to be successful. That, that, is, that, is a, that is a great response, but in there somewhere is the actual problem. And it's probably something like, you know, the signal to noise ratio of the stuff coming at an entrepreneur and you want to be the signal, not the noise, right? Yeah. And so that and getting clear about that thing. And by the way, it's really freaking hard to do. And it takes weeks sometimes with an exec team to actually get at the problem, right? So that's how we start the process is to get there. And then once you get there, you know, if it's, you, you get a quick sense of, okay, well, if you solve that problem, how big could that be? And in your particular case, I'm just sort of riffing with you a little bit here, is, well, uh, the number of entrepreneurs in Australia is probably in the hundreds of thousands, I'm guessing. You tell me if I'm wrong here. So the category potential is hundreds of thousands times something, whatever the value that you deliver. And so, so all of a sudden now I've got a sense of what the category potential is, right? And I can compare that for you versus, you know, someone like Zuck who comes in and says, well, no, I've got $4 billion and, you know, I think I can get $400 in advertising per year from each one of those. And you do that number and it ends up being a giant number, right? So that's how, that's how you really get at that. And by the way, um, you know, we sat down one time with Steve Vasulo and, uh, and talked to him about this and, and he has a similar sort of model and so do most of the great VCs. They have an intuitive sense of, okay, if I solve that problem, uh, how big is it going to be? And uh, I'll give you another example. We met uh, uh, the Zooks company. I don't know if you heard of these guys, but, um, you know, Henry Ford said back, you tell me, I think it was in the 20s, he said, you know, I'm going to invent the horseless carriage, right? Uh, well, that's a funny thing to say. That's like saying, you know, old category with a modifier. It became an automobile, right? And so now they're talking about autonomous cars or autonomous vehicles. Well, that's, again, it's a funny category, right? So there's a new category going to form, like automobiles, that's not an autonomous car. Um, and Zooks are after that. And that's... And then if you think about that, you think about it in the context of something like a Tesla or Uber or Lyft and the, and the sort of the manifestos that they're driving right now, which is, you know, basically automobiles are a thing of the past, that we own them, that they're going to be this transportation as a service. It's like, holy crap, that's a big, giant potential. I'm just using that as another example so you can kind of get that piece of it. But that's how we look at it, and that's how most of the, I think, the sophisticated investors look at this. And... And also there's one more thing to know, which is, is that categories themselves go through these life cycles where they start out as being zero billion dollar marketplaces and then they go through a very rapid develop phase in the middle. We talk about this in the book, it's called the category life cycle, and then ultimately into a sort of a dominate phase. And the reason it's important to be the company that defines this is, is that the company that dominates it actually takes about 75% of the market share of the category. 
So one company takes three quarters of the market cap of the whole freaking category, right? And so it's really important to be that company if you want to be super successful. And, you know, um, Jeff Bezos at Amazon has been a master at creating these categories. Uh, he spun out the whole AWS thing out of his company, out of, essentially out of the loins of his company, came a $7 billion, you know, company. And he defined what, you know, sort of uh, software as a service would be in a lot of ways. Um, so it's an, important, it's an important thing for an entrepreneur to do is to actually understand that they're on this journey. Um, and along with that curve that's going sort of snaking up and to the right, there's a parallel curve or another curve that overlays that, which is the number of vendors that enter into the category in the early stages skyrockets because everyone hears about it, it's hot, they understand the category value and all that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the funding dries up for some of them, but stays with some of them. And so the battle for the actual category king, as we call them, sort of starts to happen around the, the, the four to five year mark into the categories for most technologies. Um, yeah, similar to what happened around the social network sort of side where Facebook sort of took off and then everyone was trying to launch their own social, social network. Right, that's exactly right. Uh, the, the, only, the, the, the accept on that is, is that you don't, ha in most cases, you don't have to be first to win. Facebook was not first by any stretch of the imagination. We tell a story of one of our, our good friends, Paul Martino. He was the CEO and founder of a company called Tribe. And at the time, Tribe was the one of the original sort of social networks. And, you know, he, he kind of still pissed at himself that he missed it, right? Because, you know, that's a you know, trillion dollar kind of market or trillion dollar kind of category. And... Um, so it's not about necessarily being the first to market, it's the one that who defines the category in the minds of those people who are going to make the purchase decisions. And then gets the magic triangle, as we call it, the product design, the company design, and the category design together and makes those three things happen and happen, and then boom, you know, the, the winner takes 76% of the market cap. Sure. I mean, obviously, um, I'm sure you come across a lot of startups as well um, who describe themselves as Uber off or uh, you know the X of, of whatever. Uh, obviously, that's that's fundamentally different to defining your own category. For for any startup that's um, that's at that stage where they're trying to sort of define their own place, um, what what sort of process or what um, where where do you think a starting point would be for for a startup that's that's looking to to define their own category? Yeah, um, <clears throat> we we have a belief that. Uh, and Anne Mirako from Floodgate Capital is one of the legendary uh, VCs sort of said to us one time that what they're looking for are founders with what she calls a very unique insight. And the insight can either be a technical insight, uh, which has ultimately led to companies like VMware. We could virtualize a server. Uh, so that's a technical insight or a market insight. Um, you know, I'm standing on the corner in, um, in San Francisco or Melbourne, can't get a cab, pisses me off. Um, you know, uh, I need to solve that problem. So, and they're looking for, you know, driven founders who can't sleep because that problem exists. And so if you're one of those founders, you know, tr tr triple click on that insight, get at it. Is it a technical insight? Is it a market insight? And then once you've got that sort of locked, your insight was, hey, there's lots of noise, but I want to get to the signal. I'm just paraphrasing your sort of example. Yeah. Okay, I, okay, that's the insight. Cool. Now, what's the product I'm going to create? And then, of course, your podcast is that product. And how do you distribute that? Well, you've got lots of partners and all that sort of stuff. Well, what's your category? Is podcast your category? Could be. That's the Uber category. Is there something underneath that that actually is your category? Founders Insights podcast or something else. So this is where the process takes you. It, it gets to that place where it's, in, you start with the insight, figure out technical or, or market. They have different ways of manifesting in the, in the category. Then get to the category. And then what you've got to create is what we call a very unique and different or differentiated point of view. It's a story that you tell. And we didn't invent this. It's been around for a long time. In political um, uh, campaigns using it all the time. So do infomercials. And it's essentially a structure to the discussion or to the to the point of view as we call it, and it, you frame the problem, you talk about the ramifications of that problem, then you have a vision for the future, and then here are the outcomes. And you know, you think about those infomercials you see on television all night, you know, dude sitting back in a couch, 2 a.m. in the morning, hey, you fat slob, you know, you're sitting on the couch, you, you haven't been dating for the last three years, and you know, your life's terrible, right? And it's all black and white, and the dude's like this, and then 
ta-da, you know, the vision for the future is take this new drug or do this new energy and look, to do and, you know, <laughs> gorgeous girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever by themselves. Uh, and the outcome is, of course, happily life. So that sort of structure to what we call the point of view is really important to develop. Um, and there's been some fabulous ones of those. And we can talk about those. And then ultimately, how you bring that to market is a thing called, we call the lightning strike, which is we believe that you know peanut butter marketing, as we call it, which is just sort of spreading money everywhere, just doesn't work in today's age. It's just, again, to the, your point about the signal to noise, it, you, you can't process all that stuff. Um, so you do what we call the lightning strike, which is on a day, if you're in our target market, you're going to know we exist and you're going to know and feel the problem that we believe in. And if you connect with that, you're going to want to talk to us. And so that's the sort of the cycle or the methodology that you should go through. A lot of it's talked about in chapters four through sort of nine of the book. It talks about each one of those phases of what an entrepreneur should do if they want to become a great category designer. Is there a particular stage where startups should think about the category that they operate in? Absolutely. Uh, they, they should start thinking about it pretty soon um, because the first investor presentation sets the context for the value of the company. So you could argue, and I don't, but you could argue that you should start immediately. We generally say that you need to have some pretty clear view and maybe even a, a, a couple of customers to, to, to sort of testify that you've got product market fit. But once you're at that point, you've got the insight, you've kind of got the product market fit, you kind of know what your customers look like. At that point, you're, you're in the two or three year point at your, you know, at your, in the category life cycle. You've only got two or three, maybe four years to get to the sort of the, you know, the sweet spot, which is the six to 10 year window uh, to create all that value. And so um, one company that we're working with um, is a company called Clear Metal. It was uh, actually, very good friends of Lucas were at Stanford um, and created a company. At, when we met with them, they were called Tilikin, which I think was the name of their dog, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> and, um, and they also, they came in essentially as AI for shipping. Now, if I said, hey, company Tilikin, AI for shipping, I'm, you kind of looking at me like most people would, which is like, okay, that's fairly amorphous and everything else. And so we went through this process with them. This is three kids, right, uh, out of school, out of Stanford. A um, couple of customers in sort of trials. We then took them to through our through our process to since the company became Clear Metal, uh, metal being a big part of the transportation industry. It's either in containers or ships or planes or trucks, right? So it's a big thing. So Clear Metal, um, the category became predictive logistics because that's really what they were doing. It's like where should that container be, or where should that ship be, or where should that what should that port be processing? Um, and we came out with a point of view which was pretty different, which is, you know, big data meets big metal. The ship's running around the world. And those guys are off to the races. And actually, we're going to Singapore in a couple couple days. And uh, they're going to be there as well as the Port of Singapore, who just made an investment in these guys. So that's an early stage company. They, I think, raised a seed round of financing at the time. Um, and we're just in the product market fit stage. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, companies that are about to go public, some are in that six to ten window. Um, in that particular case, you know, they've got product market fit, they've got customers, they've got distribution, you know, but they still not quite. Uh, they haven't defined that category in the minds of the investors and even in the in the minds of customers. And so we spend a lot of time with them. That's they're usually longer processes and, and more time consuming. But we do that in advance of their IPO. So when someone stands up and says, you know, I've got a CRM category, people even know, know what that means, right? And what the potential of that is. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I received a copy of your book and I was flicking through. Um, and one of the things that really sort of stuck out to me was, um, that, well, first of all, there was a lot that, that kind of really <laughs> resonated with me. But one of the, the topics in particular was the courage of category design. And so the, the quote from the book was, you will run into disbelief from customers, analysts, the press, and your own employees. Competitors will mock you, and yet you have to have the courage to push through. So, you know, obviously a lot of startups um, are potentially going through that phase, especially when they have something innovative or unique that, um, you know, perhaps they've struggled to really find a way to define that and, and you know, resonate that with their, with their customers. And also, um, you know, one of the things that, that you've mentioned and, and the book touches on is the sort of the zero billion dollar market and how it usually takes the three to four years to, 
before you know you really start sort of seeing the, the market size starting to 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 build into something how does how does a startup or a founder go through those three or four years um, to kind of reap the benefits on on the other side yeah well it, it's it, it is around this this term called courage and we don't mean that in a macho sense. Uh, there are lots of incredibly courageous men and women who fight this battle. Uh, so this isn't about sort of how, how tough you are. It's more about the courage of conviction that uh, this is a problem that needs to be solved. And so long as that's burning and you're losing sleep over it, then uh, you should keep going uh, is the sort of the short answer. And the reason you have to have to take control of the category dialogue as a category king is is that s either you're going to define your category or someone else is and they're going to put you in it and there's a funny story we tell at some of our workshops which have you seen the hangover movie yeah. have you ever seen that <laughs> have you seen that have you, there's this scene where the dude wakes up and he's got a tattoo on his face remember that yeah it's the mike tyson tattoo right <laughs> and and sort of my partner dave often says you know well you know if you're going to get a tattoo you know and you wake up with Mike Tyson's tattoo on your face, I hope you like it kind of thing, right? And that's the whole point is, is like the category is like a tattoo. It's like, well, hell, I better, if I don't want a Mike Tyson tattoo, I better put one on. Um, that's, that's what the great companies do. And then the coolest thing about category design is, and it's, and it's really evil as a founder if you do this right, which is that once you define the problem, and it's a psychology part of people, is if... If you come in and say, hey, I got, you know, sort of, you know, sore leg and sore arm and, and whatever else. And I say, to you, oh, yeah, that's probably related to this and that's probably related to that. And you probably, if I understand your problem and you hear me explain the problem, you, you already think I know the solution, right? It's just the way human nature is. Oh, that guy understands exactly what I'm, I'm feeling. And so he must have the solution, right? If there's a, so if you're that entrepreneur that can explain that problem, in our particular case at Quaker was like, Look, if you're one of those sports that isn't great on TV, which is 95% of sports in the world, right? Um, and and you're, you're pissed that you can't get coverage because TV only covers golf, you know, NFL and AFL and cricket here, then we feel your pain. And we feel that data has a bigger role to play in the way that those sports are actually broadcast. You're already nodding, and so was all of the other people who loved those sports nodding, right? So it's like, I haven't even said anything yet. I haven't even said anything about my product. I've just been, you know. And so that's the power of category design, is, is that when you articulate the problem in such a powerful way and in a differentiated way, people immediately think you're the king. And then good luck competing with that. Like seriously, good luck competing with that. Um, it's really tough. Um, on, on the flip side of that, so obviously you've got, you know, especially in Australia, we see a lot of scepticism for, again, something that we kind of spoke about uh, before we turned on, on the mic. How do you balance feedback uh, versus, you know, wanting to, to follow through on conviction of your ideas? So how do you balance, um, you know, whether that be customer, whether that be market, whatever feedback that it is that you're getting, how do you know that you're the conviction that you're going is, is on the right track. Yeah, yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, and this is one thing that Agile has done good for, but also bad for. Uh, and uh, Mike Maples, again, from Floodgate Capital, sort of talks about the, the dangers of Agile, which is, is that customers kind of start to dictate what the product and the solution is, but they're coming at it through an old context usually because they don't have your insight and your vision, right? So they're looking for the strategic piece of this, which is the category design along with Agile so that you're going to somewhere as opposed to circulating around what we call in the book gravity, which is like just what is today. Um, and most of these great innovators actually take you to a new place. Um, even Steve Jobs, I, I was at the at that launch of the iPad, and I was a big skeptic. I, I, you know, when I heard about it, I was like, I got to get to this thing and actually hear why he feels so strongly about it. Because, you know, the iPhone at that time was going mental. You know, their PC sales or laptop sales were actually going up for the first time in a long time. And Steve Jobs, uh, he, now he's the greatest category designer of all time. But he stood up at the time at the actual event, and he basically said. Um, and he had behind him he had a picture of the iPhone and he had a picture of the laptop right and there was a gap in the middle and he sort of said hey this iPhone you love this thing uh, it's 
moved from being a phone to being you know your real personal thing but hey the screen's pretty small it's hard to interact with it you want to watch a movie sometimes it works on you know so it's hard in that size but so he sort of defined that space or that category of smartphone on the other side he said laptop keyboards hard to have with you and he said there's a whole new category of device uh, we believe um, this is at the launch of the iPad that is more personal more entertainment driven and allows you to experience uh, social networks and movies and things like that in a way that's different to on your phone and we believe there's a whole new category and poof, you know up shows the the iPad turn into a you know multi-billion dollar um, industry pretty much overnight and we all went home and bought the third device everyone thought no way this is going to go but it went and you know Microsoft had been at it for seven or eight years with the tablet and so he evangelized, the, he helped you and I understand where this thing fitted into our lives. It was like, oh, that's when I'm on the couch and I'm watching TV, but I'm not really watching TV and I want to kind of communicate with my friends and all that sort of stuff, but I don't want to do it with a phone because it's too small or I don't want to do it. So he was framing the problem the whole time. And then he said, ta-da, you know, buy an iPad. So we all went out and bought it, right? That's, that's what these legendary entrepreneurs do. And... That takes courage and conviction. It takes that insight that he had, which was there was a third place that we needed. Starbucks is another great example. Um, you know, Starbucks was actually called the third place. That was what they believed. They believed there was homework and this other place that you needed to be. It wasn't about coffee. It was safety and, you know, a really nice environment where you could go hang and work. And yeah, sure, we sold coffee and everything else that went along with it. But that was how Schultz's vision at the time of, you know, that was the insight he had, which was you needed a third place. And it's true, you look around Melbourne now and we just actually stopped at once. Like there's all of these third places everywhere, right? So that's what the great entrepreneurs do. They have that conviction. Um, and the, the tall poppy thing, I, uh, personally, I, I think it's a thing of the past for Australia. A lot of the entrepreneurs I've really met are like, yeah, sure, okay. The, the Australian uh, environment is like that, has been like that. But uh, here's the truth. Um, if you look at, and we'll be unveiling some of this stuff on Tuesday during our event, if you look at the history of the technology industry in Australia, um, let's over the last 30 years, uh, for the most part, um, what we've seen are companies that have taken a category from overseas and adapted it for Australia. Incredibly successful. You know, realestate.com, carsales.com, and, and many others. And uh, that's a great business. But Essentially, the category is defined by somebody and you're adapting it for this part of the world. Works good. It's about a $20 billion industry now. And then if you add to that, all of the companies got acquired who were doing that for that, but then got acquired either by the global companies or others, that's about another $5 billion, so $25 billion. What's happened with Atlassian and some of these new companies that's emerging is they're like, no, nah, this isn't about Australia. We're now in a world where the digital medium is as powerful as it's ever been, you know, in terms of mediums. And I can communicate and I can deliver services to any part of the world. And so, hey, I got to take responsibility for a global category. So if they don't believe it here in Australia, who cares? Who cares? There's lots of other parts of the world that will embrace adoption. And the great, the great entrepreneurs do that. They figure that out. And it turns out Australia actually is a great adopter of technology anyhow. So they do care about Australia. But I'm just saying that don't be strung by what an individual says. Uh, in the early days of Quokka, just so you know, it all looks great in hindsight now. As you look back, it's a dead straight line. He went there, he went there, da, 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 da. I can tell you it was the biggest zigzag across a map you've ever seen in your life. And our first time, uh, both John Bertrand and I started pitching this vision for digital sports media, there wasn't anyone who believed in that. No one's, everyone said, oh, no way, the media companies will dominate that space, you guys will get crushed. We probably did 25 VC pitches to, you know, to some of the great VCs in the world, they all walked away and said, no, you'll never make it. And then one said, you know what, that's different. That is a different insight. I'm going to back you. And then all the guys who said no came running back saying, oh, just kidding, you know. And so it only takes one. And once you get that belief, then you can roll. Absolutely. I'm, you're right. It only, it only takes one to, to say yes. Um, that's, that's definitely all you need. Um, Lucas, so you obviously led a lot of the data and research behind the book. 
can you share a lot of um, you know some of the insights that, that you sort of found that maybe not be you know obviously we, we've touched on some of the some of the findings but um, any sort of insights that you think may not be um, as sort of straightforward or, or as easy to, to pick up uh, yeah that's an interesting question um, I think I'll, I'll sort of hone in on one finding that we had from the book which is this concept of the 610 law um, and kind of how it relates to the sort of category design life cycle that Dad was talking about. So um, what we noticed was if you look at the amount of time uh, that a company's been around, so from when it was founded to when it went to IPO, and then you look at the amount of money that the company um, was valued at at IPO and then at its, its current public lookup, um, you sort of notice this weird trend where all the companies, sort of like we were talking about with the life cycle, in the middle between six and ten years, they're driving all the value, or they have all the value, right? Being a Facebook, right, that's a massive spike in the middle of that, if you imagine it like a curve or a histogram, right? And then everything sort of below six years, um, it's really low. Why is that? They're not creating that much value. They've only been around six or less years, or vice versa, other side of the tail, right? You're above ten years, you're not getting that big of returns, but you've been around for so long, why haven't you gotten it done, right? Um, and that was something we really mulled over for quite a long time. It doesn't make a ton of sense if you think about it, right? It seems like the longer you're around, the more money you should, or more valuation you should be able to create, right? And that's sort of how we tied it into the life cycle, right? There's an amount of time that people need to have to wrap their head around a category, right? Like, what's the problem? How's it relevant to me? I don't really feel like it's too new. So did they, they go too early before the idea was really like internalized by people? Or flip side, like we waited way too long, right? Nobody cares about the problem, it's not relevant. Um, and so I guess that's the, the insight, right? There's that like relation between the, kind of the psychology of how we internalize a problem and, and feel like, oh yeah, you are solving it, right? With the product um, versus, you know, the actual valuation. There's a, there's a direct link. Um, I'd say that's sort of the, the biggest insight we came, came out of um, the sort of data research we did. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess that really affects startups in terms of the timelines that they think about things, and from a VC perspective as Definitely. well. You know, giving them an understanding of what sort of timelines that they're working for, it might not be as similar to, to other things where you know the category has already been defined and, and they're playing in a in a different market. Yeah, yeah. And here's a funny part of that story. I mean, when we took a lot of the research that Lukey did and started essentially doing a little bit of an internal roadshow with some of the sort of friendly VCs in in the valley. And we kept showing them these charts. And I remember one day, one of the VCs, I'm not going to have to tell you who it was, sort of laid back in their chair and said, that's really interesting. He said, how, how many years do you think a VC fund goes for? And I said, actually, I don't know. How many years do they go for? And he said, about 10 years. It's like, oh, I <laughs> see. So the funds go until the end of the sort of this turning point of the, of the whole market. And then it does, nothing happens after that. And the same VCs and said, and why do you think, and they were one of the VCs that really invested in clean tech at the time, so I said, why do you think that the clean tech doesn't really turn out to be a very good uh, venture investment? And we said, no clue. He says, because the category life cycle in those worlds is in the 30 year range as opposed to the 10 year range. And then we're like, holy smokes. And actually, then we came back and we said to Luke, okay, separate the data into enterprise and consumer just for fun. And turns out the consumer companies, of course, are skewed to the bottom end, i.e. the early stage because adoption can happen much faster and the enterprise companies, you know, are at the long end of the thing. And so that's when we really got confidence that this 610 law and some of these research findings were really relevant for, uh, for entrepreneurs. You have a whole industry, the venture industry, who have a timeline of 10 years. You have technology adoption, which happening in that sort of a range. And you have this window in the middle that's really, really, really um, where all the value gets created. And I think part of the, the interesting sort of moving forward research efforts is how many other ways can you look at it, right? You can break it down enterprise consumer, um, looking at it specific again for like Australia, right? Is there going to be a different sort of curve essentially for Australia, how fast can something get picked up? Um, so you could look at it from different markets or even like we're sort of talking about like different technologies, different categories of, uh, or like Uber categories of, of industries. So it's on the way. Yep. <laughs> um, so I, I guess kind of, you know, we've spoken a little bit about the process of, of the startup that's looking to define its own category. Once you have that defined, how do you actually spread the word? 
and get that out there so that people are familiar with with the categories that, that you've created. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. That's a great question too. And and the the answer is is you do a series of what we call lightning strikes to condition the market to uh, understand that a this problem exists, b that they have it, c that you're the company that's the expert in that problem and D, that there is a solution that they can come by or use. And uh, we, we recommend two lightning strikes each year. And again, if you're just using Apple as the example, they had two events every year. They were what we call lightning strikes, which is when everything comes together from the whole company, product announcements, you know, new, new, new perspectives on industry, everything else that you, that you want to tie together around this, sort of this problem definition or this category definition. And uh, so these lightning strikes become a, a forcing function for the whole company to work together to essentially do what most people would think of as a product launch. Uh, you know, hey, we're going to launch a new version two or version three or whatever it might be of the product. And uh, each time you do this, you set the agenda for the category because you're framing this problem. You're talking about why it's so, the ramifications of the problem, why it's so important. You're talking about a vision for the future, which is usually two or three years over the horizon. Um, if you looked at Zuck's F8 um, presentation, um, he, he made a switch in Facebook that you may not have picked up on, which was his company changed from actually social network to a communications company. And he did it at F8. And he stood up and he explained the future of communication over a 10 year period. And he related everything that they'd done in the past to that. And he related everything they were gonna do in the future to that. So he was conditioning the minds of us all we're making a change here, people. We're not just a social networking company anymore. We're a communications company. And so every time you do one of these sort of launches, and yeah, as you'd say, lightning strikes, uh, it's an opportunity for you to move the category agenda forward. And then the companies that are chasing you, good luck, because you're reacting to the statements that Zuck just made. He's already off to the next lightning strike figuring out what he's going to say in six months time and you're still dealing with the you know sort of the the backlash of all the you know, the issues that he's created now that's what the great kings do is they just let this thing go every six months plus or minus and they lay out their vision for the category they focus on the problem and they just relentless about pounding that and uh you know the me too i've got a better one or i've got a faster one carbon ingulator um you know they, those those companies don't last uh, so, coming back to, to a startup um, that's at a relatively early, earlier stage, um, you know, I guess if, if they were to do an, an event, they wouldn't pull the crowd or the, you know, <laughs> the, the press that uh, Mark Zuckerberg would or something like that. What, what do you recommend for, for a startup um, to create those sort of lightning strikes for them? Well, Zuck, think about Zuck for a second in the early days. What did he do? He won Harvard. His strike was to get every single student from Harvard to use the book. Yeah. And then he said, okay, now I've got Harvard, I'm gonna get XYZ, Princeton, and then somebody else. So he wasn't, he wasn't standing up sort of like, you know, pronouncing social networks of the world and New York Chimes and everybody else reporting at that time. He wasn't, he was like, I'm gonna get that. Everyone who's in the Harvard ecosystem is gonna know that this thing exists and they should be using it. That's what we tell the great founders to do, is figure out who that audience is from day one and absolutely, and there might only be a thousand people in that particular uh, circuit in the early stages who really, really, really feel that problem that you want to tackle initially. Make sure those people in that first lightning strike really feel you and hear you articulate a problem that they really emotionally attach with. Then let's now start to deal with the concentric circles. Each time we do one of these strikes, we start broadening the, ap broadening the aperture. Um, you know, think about think think about Amazon in the early days. It was a book store online book store does it look like an online bookstore now not even close no what did they do well they started with books and then they verticalized every other goddamn industry and then they all of a sudden they realized holy smokes we can create a marketplace and then holy smokes we can create a back-end infrastructure that supports that it's called aws and by the way why don't we try some phones and you know but when we replace books with tablets i mean you know that's what the legendary entrepreneurs do they do that continuous category design as we call it in the book they never ever stop um that brings up a really really interesting point of uh the vision of, of a company um and how do you sort of see that evolving over time with with categories so, so take the the example of amazon for you know start off with an online 
um, you know, bookstore. Book I, I don't imagine that, that um, Jeff had the vision of, of Amazon being what it is today. Um, how do how does yeah in, in your so from your experience how does that kind of vision evolve and and what does that look like? Yeah, it, it's 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 those are, these examples and many of them are in the book. Uh, they all start with this founding insight, which is we have this problem. In 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 Bezos's case, his problem was bookstores suck. You had to go to them. Uh, you know, in the case of Netflix. You had to go to a video store. Usually the video you wanted wasn't available. The dude behind the desk was a sweaty guy, couldn't give a rats about you. You took the video that you didn't want home, had a late fee. The whole thing was a shitty experience, right? And he imagined, well, what about if you just sort of, in your living room when you wanted to watch this thing, selected the movie and pressed play? And at the time everyone said, oh yeah, sure. You know, good luck with that. And, and, and of course, you know, technology caught up. We all got broadband at home and everything else. And so. The, the founding vision is the starting point. And then I think what happens, or not I think, what happens with these great companies is, is they realize when they solve that problem, they're actually only solving a small part of a much bigger problem. And so then they begin to expand, whether it's through verticals or whether it's through territories or through any other mechanism. And all of a sudden, the category itself starts expanding. And that's why Steve Vasulo from First Round Capital says, you know, I'm looking for those zero billion dollar markets because they're going to start somewhere, but then it's going to be billions at some point future. That's what I'm looking for. Sure. Um, that kind of just brings me back to Copper Sports and, and how you sort of started with one sport and then expanded out from there. Um, so for, from that experience, did you always know with Crocker that it was for sports in general or was the vision to, to always just win with one particular sport? It was never, it was always related to sailing. Yeah. So, and that's and it's a funny story because I remember when, so it was always related to sailing and that was the insight that we had because we just knew sailing so well from being in the America's Cup and using technology at the most applied level in a sport, in that particular case yachting, than any of the other yacht races that happened. If you think about it, the America's Cup is just one of you know, hundreds of events that happen within sailing. And so you could say, well, geez, that will, that'll take your lifetime to solve that problem, you know, and then, you, but what we found was as we did that, we were like, okay, well then what other sports have lots of data? And if you ask that question, that gives you a list that's way longer. Uh, and you could argue with every sport nowadays, as you were saying, you know, you're a Liverpool fan and even soccer, which those, that, they have nothing on them. There's no timing. There's a scoring system. And obviously timing is the you know, start and stop for the, for the halves and everything. But, you know, then people started thinking, well, why don't we measure uh, how far these folks run? Um, and we did some stuff in the early days, back in the 90s. We had biometrics on athletes on Everest. And we were measuring heart rates and body temperatures and you know, blood, you know, alcohol, not alcohol, um, oxygen levels in the blood and all that kind of stuff. And that really gives you a unique insight into sport. So as, every time we pushed this question, which was this founding insight, which was data, at the time was data in yachting, to, hey, how could that apply to other sports? We realized, holy smokes, it does apply. And of course, now, if you watch any broadcast of any kind, whether it's TV or internet, you'll see that data is the predominant thing, you know. Uh, Formula One is another great sport that we both love, and that is driven by data. And I remember being in a meeting with Bernie Egglestone back in 98, and I sh we showed him some of our future vision of what you now see on television, funnily enough, and he said, over my dead effing body and walked out of the room kind of thing. So, you know, it takes time <laughs> for the industry to come to terms with this stuff. Um, so final question. Uh, obviously, you've worked with a lot of really interesting startups, and within a lot of verticals, within a lot of interesting categories. Um, what, what one or two sort of categories are most interesting to you at the moment that you've worked with or, or that you've seen? Whew. Um, I, I think there's, it's more of an Uber category, but I think this machine learning thing actually has legs. Um, back in the 80s, we were into artificial intelligence and LISP and expert systems and all that sort of stuff. and. Um, it didn't really go anywhere uh, other than some small use cases, but it's very clear that the algorithms, and Lucas can explain more about the algorithms because he's the data science guy, but it's very clear that machine learning is touching a lot more of the things that we used to do, and that's really powerful. And so the applications of machine learning or embedded machine learning into 
uh, you, if, for the most part, enterprise systems, but even in our email and social networks and everywhere else, that's all driven by that stuff now. So that's a big Uber category. Uh, I'm personally really excited by this autonomous car category. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be called. Uh, it's not going to be called autonomous car, again, for the reasons that we talked about, that the Henry Ford's vision wasn't a horseless carriage. It was an automobile. Um, so that one's really, really fascinating, and uh, it, it has the it has great potential to really change our world in a really positive way as well. Uh, and the third one, I think, is one that we see really ramping up in the United States, and I bet it does everywhere else in the world, is so this whole health care, and I hate to use that term because it's such a dumb category name and we're going to have to change it, but there's a thing around health and personalized health that is going to fundamentally transform us as people and probably the planet as a result. And uh, that one gets me really excited too. I, I heard a great talk recently about how um, someone in, within research in the, in the health tech space um, sees the future of, of medicine as being really personalized. Um, and that being the future and that we'll sort of look back and go, what were we doing? This is kind of like the, the dark ages of, of medicine. So. Absolutely. Um, Al, Al and Lucas, for, for anyone that wants to sort of find out more about your background, get in touch, buy a copy of, of Play Bigger, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, playbigger.com is where you know, essentially we live. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at playbigger or facebook.com slash playbigger. Um, the book is available here in Australia on Booktopia, um, so that would be probably the best place to go buy it. Uh, if you're in Melbourne uh, on the 21st, uh, come join us. We've got a fabulous panel discussing a lot of this stuff here in Melbourne, and that'll be available uh, through Eurohit or via playbigger.com. Fantastic. I'll make sure those links are in the show notes. Alan Lucas, thank you so much for, for your time and, and for sharing your insights today. Um, and I highly recommend getting Play, Play Bigger. It's, it's a fantastic read and, um, yeah, definitely definitely worth shelling out $20, $25 for it. Um, guys, thanks, thanks once again. Thanks, Laura. It's a real so pleasure. Much, thanks for listening to episode 42 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Al and Lucas along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Next week, I will be interviewing John Bayer, a successful founder, mentor, and self-described recovering VC. In the interview, we talk about how to negotiate with investors, finding the right valuation, how to get the right mentors and advisors for your business, and the misconceptions of Silicon Valley. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 43 next week.